be the website, the mobile app, whether you catch it live or you catch it later. It's always good to have you join us in this capacity. But I've been saying this for some years. I'm going to keep saying it for some years more. If you're watching online, listen, time to get off your couch, out of your cubicle, get to a Bible-believing, teaching church. You're not destined to do life alone. And to be honest with you, you got to be in fellowship with God's people all around this country. So get here Sunday nights at 6 p.m. or get somewhere and be and become everything God has in store for you to be and become. Amen? Amen. Well, church, it's good to be here with you guys tonight as we are getting ready to uh, start a brand new sermon series tonight called Catalyst Week 1. And Catalyst Week 1 is about awakening the catalyst in you. And um, I'm pretty excited just to, to be with you guys. We're going to be here in this building permanently on Sunday nights. We are intentionally doing on Sunday nights. If you haven't heard yet, we're not meeting on Sunday mornings. Uh, church buildings on Sunday mornings at the most evangelistic time in the American population is between 10 and 11 a.m. on Sunday morning. There's a bunch of people that can't make it there. And I, to be honest with you, we're going to kill the vibe of the business church. It is people that are priority. Jesus is the brand. We will be a missional community. We will live generously. We will give it all away. And we will help you, your sons and daughters, your grandmas and grandpas be and become your absolute best what God instills and intends for you to become. Amen? All right? So we don't measure. The, the, the broken scorecard of the American church got thrown out. We don't care. We're not successful by our attendance or our bank account or how many this, that, or the other. Amen? All right. We're successful by you individually, your family individually, being and becoming everything Christ intends you to be. That the catalytic movement of the Holy Spirit would be so dynamic and so defined and so intentional in your life that it would radically change your life and everything around you. Amen? Amen? I believe the devil is in sound equipment. So when this mic pops like that, it's because he's trying to interrupt me. Because the word of God does not return void. So through the pops, the bangs, and the booms, the devil's a liar. The truth does not return void. Amen? Who wants to hear the truth tonight? Please say amen. amen. All right, so let's get down to some truth. Some devil stomping, Jesus preaching truth. Like, Dave, you fired up? Better believe it. Came fired up. Got a new chest tattoo and everything, right? All right. It says, it is well with my soul. Is it well with your soul tonight? Because when you walk in the power of the Holy Spirit, I don't care what you got going on. I don't care where you've been, where you're going. It should be well with your soul because his name is hope. Amen? Man, all right. This word catalyst is a big deal. I love the word catalyst because the catalyst is not only a scientific term, but there's also this very catalytic movement that God does in our lives. First of all, let me just tell you what the word catalyst means. Catalyst is a substance. Here is your education moment, right? A catalyst is a substance that increases the rate of a chemical reaction without itself undergoing any permanent chemical change. So what it means is a catalyst is a thing that goes in the middle that creates change over here and change over here, but it has not changed itself. The reality is a catalyst is a person or a thing that pre uh, precipitates an event. So a person, a thing, something that happens in the middle that has not changed itself, but it brings change to everyone or everything around it. A catalyst. Would you believe that God is called not only to do something that is a catalyst in your life that brings a catalytic change between you and your humanity and the eternal God, the Father, by bringing the Holy Spirit to interact between your temporary flesh and the eternal nature of God? That the Holy Spirit wants to be a catalyst that in your temporary humanity, he brings and renders radical change to you and radical change to the realm of eternity that is currently without us, right? And that the laid down life of Christ, bang, bang, pop. Turn that down a little bit, maybe. I think that's a little sensitive. My mouth is big. Amen? All right. The sensitivity of the Holy Spirit is that it would bring radical change, catalytic change to your temporary natural human life in the realm of eternity. That there's a catalyst change that happens between eternity and temporary in your life. The reality is the Holy Spirit brings this catalyst between God and man. Now check this out. The Holy Spirit is that catalyst that brings radical change. And it's in Acts chapter 1 verse 8. And this is what the word says. 
The word says, but you, every one of you, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Now check this out. You and I in our natural status or our natural state are not able to do anything to please God. You and I in our natural born state, we are separated from God until this moment of salvation that occurs in our lives. When God does a supernatural work in our lives, saving us from ourselves, from our death, from our damnation, from our hell, from our brokenness, our sinfulness, our shame and our guilt. And the reality is when God does that, this is what he says. He promises that he will fill us with the Holy Spirit. It's like if you had a really nice car and it was shiny and it was pretty and it looked fast. But if you didn't put no gas in that car, that car is worthless, right? Right? Like if you had to make your car payment every single month, but you couldn't drive the car because there was no gas in the car, it's a worthless vehicle. You see, as a Christian... The Bible says that there'll be a catalytic change in your life. God will save you. God will redeem you. God will rescue you from our eternal damnation when we call on the name Jesus. But then there's the promise of the Holy Spirit. He says, I will fill you with power when the Holy Spirit comes upon your life and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. But see, he said i got to do it in you before I can do it through you and before I can do it all around you. And there's too many preachers standing in pulpits and teachers and Christians that go to church on Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night Bible study. And they, they want it to happen around them and they want it to happen through them. But check it out. If the Holy Spirit ain't doing it in them, then there ain't nothing good gonna come through them. The Bible tells us in the last days, be careful, be cautious, because there's those that have a form of godliness, but they deny the power. What power? The power of the Holy Spirit. It's the reason I say it all the time. You can do church in America. You ain't got to have the Holy Spirit of God show up. The truth of the matter is you can have sin in your camp. And people do it all the time because it functions like business. Now, listen, when the Holy Spirit of God is working in you, then he can work through you, and then he can impact the life around you. And this is the catalytic movement that he promises in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. I'm going to be honest with you, the Holy Spirit of God is not talked nearly enough about in the world today or the church today. Right? That we, we, we put so much focus and energy and effort on what we do in the building or what we're doing with our kids or doing with our students or doing with whatever. The truth is, we need to spend more time talking about the Holy Spirit trying to do in you. Because if he don't do it in you, he can't do it through you. And if you can't do it through you, it's not going to impact anything around you. Amen? I love this promise. He says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will then be my witnesses to to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. In other words, every one of you, everywhere you go, every single day, God's plan missionally is that you would be the hands, the feet, his witnesses. And you know, there's no greater witness There's no greater witness than your own story. There's no greater testimony of the goodness of God than your own story. Can I be real honest with you? At the end of the day, every human being I've ever met is very self-centered and selfish. I can tell you what God's done in my life. And you can say, cool story, bro. It's a cool story. But what you really want to know is what can God do in my life? You know what people really want to know? People really want to know if there's such a good and gracious and wonderful God. I'm glad he did it in your life, Dave. I'm glad he did it in your life, Susie Q. But people really want to know if there's a real, loving, generous God, what can he do in my life? At the end of the day, cool story, bro. Good story, sir. But what can this loving, generous, gracious God do in my life? And that's what really people want to hear. Truth is, I love the fact that he didn't say, you six or seven, you ten or twelve, you select few that are going to go off to Bible college and get yourself a little degree and throw it up on the wall and put it on your Facebook and put it on your LinkedIn and put it on your professionalism of how smart you are and educated. No, that's not what he says here. The word of God didn't say, you few, you called. He said, you're all called. 
He says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Who? You. 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 God's intention and design is that he would awaken a catalyst that lives within you via the Holy Spirit that you might be and become so deeply involved personally in a relationship with him that no matter where it is, every single day, everywhere you go, you just can't help yourself. You, even if your mouth ain't preaching, your life's the greatest sermon you ever lived. That everywhere you go, you become this catalytic movement of God's Holy Spirit working in and through you. But you will receive power. Who? You will. It's the promise of the Holy Spirit. Can I be honest? I don't even know how in the world I would ever go to church, try to be a Christ follower, try to be a Christian without the Holy Spirit. It's an impossible life. It's like trying to say... We are going to will ourselves to follow the rules, but we all hate rules. This life of Christianity, following Christ, becoming like Christ, becoming what God designs for you and your family, your kids, your life, it is wrapped up, first and foremost, guys, when the catalyst of the Holy Spirit brings change between you and and the eternal glory of God by doing a work in your life. Has he done a work in your life? You, I'm asking, has he done a work in your life? Like, is he working in your life? Or are you just going through the motions of church talking, Jesus talking, little Bible scripture reading, daily devotion on your Facebook, doing something that's like it's Christian activity but is it Christ following? Because there's a major, 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 vast difference. And see, what God's really getting after is he wants to do something that is catalytic in you. He wants to have such a deep, personal movement of the Holy Spirit in you that he fills you with power. And he now allows you to possess the ability to live this thing radically differently than you've ever been able to live it before. You know what happens when the Holy Spirit fills us and this catalyst change occurs? When God changes something in us that we cannot change in ourselves, all of a sudden, our desires are different. Our priorities are different. Our dreams are different. Our doings daily are different. There's a lot less of me. There's a lot less of you. There's a lot more focus on him. We stop saying, this is what I want, Lord. This is what I want. We start to say, what do you want? What do you desire? What's your plan for my life? See, in order for us to live out the second half of Acts 1-8, a missional community that Christ calls us to be, in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the world. That's Grove City and beyond. That's Columbus and beyond. That's Hilliard and beyond. That's Dublin and beyond. That's Akron and beyond. That's even as far as Michigan. Whoa, right? I know. God's trying to redeem Wolverine. Just don't send me ever. Joking. No, really, don't send me. I'm not joking. <laughs> trying to make me disobey the Lord. <laughs> The truth is, as God's plan is for us to fulfill the second half of Acts 1-8, but guess what? You and I, missionally, can't even be in the game. We're not even in the discussion. We're not even off the bench on the field if the first part of Acts 1-8 ain't occurring in our life. If the Holy Spirit ain't doing the work in you, you can sign up to do all the church work you want to do. But he can never work through you properly until he's worked in you deeply. We're going to talk about how that happens in our life in a few moments. I love this. The catalyst works in you in order to awaken you that you can be worked through. I love it's in Exodus chapter 3, 11 through 15. Because let me bring a person involved. You're like, that's a great story, Dave. That's a great scripture. Very broad stroke. Great, God wants to work in me through the promise of the Holy Spirit so then he can use my life to the ends of the earth. 
And some of you, that might be to the end of your street, to the end of your driveway, to the end of your cubicle row at work, to the end of the carpenter swinging a hammer next to you. Maybe that's the extent of it. Maybe you'll never stand on a platform. Can I tell you something? I am confident and convinced that God's desire is to reach, win, and impact the world through more people that sit in these seats of churches across America than some loudmouth preaching, teaching, educated pastor. Do you understand that? Like, I don't look at my life and go, oh, I'm part of God's elected, anointed, and the chosen few. No. This comes with a role, and this role of being your pastor is to, is to empower you through the word of God, your children, that they might live it where God's trying to bring change to the real world in your life, then through your life, on a day-to-day basis at your workplace, and everywhere you go. The truth is, we've got a bunch of people, men and women, that we put on pedestals, and they're our favorite preachers, and they write books, and they teach at seminars, and that's all cool. But guess what? In the grand scheme of things, one man or one woman might be able to reach 10,000 or 20,000. But could you imagine if the 20,000 men and women that they reached was to reach everyone else around them? By making the daily environment that you live, work, and play the mission field of God, that is the Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. And I love this humbling story from Exodus 3, 11 through 15. Because, see, you and I are some excuse-making people. It's our nature to tell God, oh, God, who am I? I'm just a mailman. I'm just a car salesman. I'm just a rodeo worker. I'm just a painter. I'm just a DJ. I'm just a, I'm just a this. And we like to tell God all the reasons why we're not really all that great and why he probably needs someone who's really great to do something for the world that he's trying to redeem. We allow the disbelief in ourselves that's probably been put us by those around us, right? People who lost their dreams a long time ago. You know what they usually do? Dash the dreams of others because misery loves company. The truth is, there's a story in scripture. You might have heard of this guy before if you've been going to church a while. Dude's name was Moses. Anybody ever heard of Moses? Would you ever put yourself on the same platform as Moses? You'd be like, yeah, I'm up there with Moses. Anybody in here? Not me. I'd be like, yeah, I was just reflecting how my life's a lot like Moses. Anybody ever do that? No, we read these men and women from the Bible and we go, wow, we're in all and we're amazed at their leadership and their relationship to God, and we learn from them. But you know Moses tried to make excuses to God like you and I do? See, God wanted to do a work in him like he wants to do a work in you. In order that he might work through him the same as he wants to work through you. Check this out. In Exodus chapter 3, verse 11 through 15, now, keep in mind, God wants to do a catalytic work in you so he can do a catalyst work through you. And he can't awaken the catalyst purpose in your life that you live out daily until he has done a catalyst work in you where you surrender to him. I love this. Exodus 3, 11 through 15. But Moses said, but Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to the Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And God said, I will be with you. And this will be the sign to you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. And Moses said to God, okay, well, suppose I go to the Israelites. And I say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, what in his name? Then what shall I tell him? God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say to the Israelites, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever. The name you shall call me from generation to generation. You know what I love about the simplicity of scripture? We live in a generation in a world that's got to complicate everything. 
You know what? The word of God is it's black and white. It says what it says. It does not mince words. We live in a world of a bunch of word mincing people. Perception becomes reality. Well, I think what they were saying is, no, I think you said it really clear. Don't complicate the simple truth of the word. Moses was trying to, eh, who am I? I mean, seriously, God, who am I? You're freaking me out now. You're talking to me in a burning bush. I'm just a guy. I'm just a dude. I'm not the smartest. I'm not the most educated. I'm not this. I'm not that. I'm not the best looking. I'm not the best speaker. I'm not the best dressed. I'm not the most influential. I didn't have the best abs in high school. I didn't have the most popular, uh, the most willing to succeed. Probably going to succeed. I didn't have any of those accolades from the human race. Who do you think I am, God? I'm not the guy. I'm not the one. I love that Moses had that attitude because we know him as Moses. Moses was reflecting against himself, against the high catalytic call of God. And then God tells him real clean, real clear, real direct, real straight. Moses is simple. You tell him this. Okay, well, God, suppose, suppose these things called human beings don't listen. They argue. They debate. They say this. They say that. What do I say then? Moses. Keep it simple, Moses. Say this. Period. What it, can I be honest? You know, I think that's how God works in our lives a lot. We just choose to complicate it because we complicate everything in the human race. I think God says, do this. And we go, can't be that simple. Is it that simple, God? Yeah, it's that stinking simple. Do this. Nah, I think there's an angle here. I think there's a catch. I think we're getting snowed here. Right? Because why? You work in business and you have family members and you have hustle friends. And there's always an angle, right? True? Anybody go to work and you think everything that everyone at your job says to you or your friends say to you. Or your colleagues say to you that it's just like it's on the up and up. Or do you have some shady people in your life? Raise your hand if you ever had some shady people in your life at work. Yeah. They got an agenda. Right? <laughs> so here is Moses like, I don't know. Is it that simple? Moses, it's that simple. Say this. Do this. End of story. Period. It's that simple, Moses. That's called obedience. I love the heart because you and I can tie right into the story of Moses. You can I, you and I can get into the story of Moses. You go, God, I think you got the wrong guy, the wrong gal. I'm not a. And you know what oftentimes happens to us? Those around us will solidify those doubts and disbeliefs you have in your life, won't they? They say, I want to, but I don't feel like I can be up there on that platform. And then someone says, no, you're right, you can't be. You're a little too old. No, 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 you're right, you can't be. You're getting a late start in life. No, 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 you can't be. Be be Because you haven't met these requirements or this requirement. And what happens to your head and your heart? Like Moses, you sink back into your shell of why you can't. And so therefore you continue and you don't. And therefore, the catalyst inside you continues to be locked up, sleeping, which is detrimental to the second half of Acts chapter 1, verse 8. He says, I will fill you with power of the Holy Spirit. Who? You, all of you, every one of you. And when that Holy Spirit doesn't work in you, it's going to awaken. It's going to awaken this catalyst, purpose-driven God-fearing reality that you are designed for, that only you're designed for. Like, I want you to hear this tonight. Do you know that you are on this planet unique and special? You are one of a kind. That ain't no bull crap. Everybody gets a trophy line, okay? Because where I come from, everyone don't get a trophy. There are clear-cut winners and losers. My kid lost the other day. What was the score? You lost. 14 to 10. Coach said we don't keep score. We do keep score. Because if you learn to lose with grace and mercy at 7, you won't be a pompous baby at 17 or 27. You lost. 
But it's okay. We all lose, and losing is all about learning. We lost. We lost. Man, we lost. All right. I know it hurts, don't it, son? Losing is terrible. But the truth is, what I'm saying is, is this is not a year special, year unique, unique. Everyone gets a trophy. That's not this mentality. That's a God-given, thus saith the Lord declaration over your life tonight. I'm telling you right now, spiritually, as the pastor of this church, thus saith the Lord declaration over your life tonight. You are one of a kind. You're the only you in the human race. You're the only you on planet Earth. You watching tonight, you're the only you out there. That means God's got something for you and every single one of you, but he needs to awaken the catalytic purpose of your life. So that you can succeed in it. And I think the sleeping church is filled with men and women like you and me. That they are sleeping. That catalyst is so dead and asleep inside them. Because the Holy Spirit hasn't been able to do a deep work in them. In order to waken them. So we can do a work through them. We start on the Moses mentality. Ah, I'm not the guy. I'm just the. Moses said hey. I'm just this guy. God said, great. Then say this and do this. You know, he's the same God today as he's always been. He's the same God today, and he's given you the same answers he gave Moses. There's a purpose. There's a plan. Every one of you are unique and special, designed by purpose, on purpose, for God's purpose. You have the job you have. You have the life you have. You have the circumstances you have in order that right here, the back half of Acts 1-8, Judea, Samaria, the ends of the world. You're the catalyst that goes to the ends of the world, day in and day out. I love this. In John 14, 12 through 14, he says this. He says, very truly, I tell you this. Whoever believes in me will do the works I've been doing, Jesus says, and they will do even greater things than these. Because I'm going to the Father, and I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. We, 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 we can choose to be, you can choose to be two things in your life. You can choose to be a church attending Christian who can quote it. Or you can choose to be a church attending Christian who believes it and lives it. I believe this. Like, we are not, listen, I'm going to tell you right now, right? I'm just, I'm warming up, right? The Lord's taking more shackles on off my life. That's great. But, like, we're not sitting in this room by happenstance. No, the catalytic movement of the Holy Spirit, on purpose, here on purpose, he is a purposeful God, said, no, be patient, be obedient. Let me work in you, and then let me work through you. Because it's all about him anyways. We're in this building on purpose. On Sunday nights at 6 p.m. On purpose. By his design. Why? Because he says this. Anything you ask of me, I will do it. How many of you sat and prayed with me in a quiet room or through a text message or some said, God, we are looking for a place to meet? Uh-huh. Well, here we are. You're, sounds kind of boastful, Dave. I am. His name is Jesus. I will boast in Jesus all the day long. I hope, my, I, hope my, I hope you see my swag on a thousand for Jesus. He did it. Not you, not me. He, him, for his glory, for his purpose, for his doing. That he might do something in you and awaken the thing that he has designed you to be in you so that he can do it through you. Like, have you ever got up and gone to your job or to the places in your life and thought, I am right here, right now, on purpose. I constructed this business deal today on God's design. I fixed this house today by God's design. I met this person today by God's design. I love this. He says, I tell you the truth. Whoever believes in me will do the works I've been doing, but they will do even greater things than these because I'm going to the Father. I will do whatever you ask in my name. I don't think believers believe that if they ask in his name, they'll do it. We go to church. 
we regurgitate the church language. But there's a big difference when we live it and we believe it. When the Holy Spirit does a catalytic change in us, he can now do a catalytic change through us. And he says, whatever you ask in my name, (laughs) I will do it so that the Father may be glorified through the Son. That's why we pray this in Jesus' name. Declaration in Jesus' name. I declare it in Jesus' name. Not in hope. Not hope it works out. Not in any business name, denomination name, entertainment name, pastor so-and-so's big fancy name, book deal name. Nope. My hope and your hope is in Jesus and Jesus alone. Guys, he wants to do it in you. Tonight, let me ask you, is the Holy Spirit of God done a deep work in you? In your marriage, in your relationships, in your children, in your grandchildren? Has he done a deep work in you? Because that's where he wants to start. Sometimes I think we get too caught up in the church about wanting to get people doing something for others when they haven't even experienced the power of the Holy Spirit for themselves. And that's like having a fancy car with no gas. Looks good on Sunday. She's shiny on Sunday night. They can't perform because they ain't got the goods. If you ain't got the goods, you're going to fake it. And guess what? Can I tell you about this Jesus thing? You can't fake it till you make it. You will fake it and you will never make it. But how we can make it is when the Holy Spirit does a catalyst work in you, setting you up, awakens this catalyst inside you to work through you. And isn't it crazy that Jesus is talking about you and he says, those who believe will do the same works I've been doing. They'll do greater works. Hey, we live in a church that is depleted, a church world in America, Christians that are depleted in seeing miracles happen. When's the, when's the last time you heard an outpouring of miracles? Did you think it's because he ain't a, a wonder-working God? All of a sudden, the power and the blood dried up? No. Can I tell you what changed? The heart and mankind uh, of Christianity. We no longer claim in Jesus' name this wonder-working power in the blood of Jesus. We don't talk about, walk about, and be filled with the Holy Spirit. We have found a new formation of doing church business. And it's the catalyst of man rather than the catalyst of God. And that has nothing to do with you and me. Has he done a deep work in you so that he can awaken the deeper purpose of your life? That you might do the things he does, but do greater things yet? Those are all great, Dave. I want to do that. How do I do that? I'm going to give you three things. I'm going to ask uh, Chad to come. I'm going to give you three things specifically. You want to live this life? In this room tonight, you want to live this life? You you want to have this this catalyst moment in your life? You want to have a catalytic experience with the Holy Spirit that's going to then move you to let God awaken the catalyst in you that he can work through you and your family to be and become everything you're designed to be? Check this out. It's these three things. I'm going to tell you right now. Guys, ready for this? This is this is a this is kind of like do your business or get off the pot kind of moment. Ready? Ain't no more games. This is God's honest truth. You do these things, it will position and align you for God to work in you and then work through you. If you do not do these things, you might go to church the rest of your life, but you will have this wandering moment in the wilderness of Christian service of why God aren't you showing up and showing off in my life. I like to believe in miracles, but God, I just don't see it. God, me, I'm, I'm, I'm. Ready? Daily surrender to your life. This ain't a one-hit wonder. This ain't something you did in 1955 or 2012 or 2018. One-hit wonder. I said a prayer and wham, bam, thank you, ma'am. All is glorious and good. No. No. No one hit wonders. Daily. A daily surrendering to Christ in your life is the only way the Holy Spirit can move in you deeply. That's why the Bible says take up your cross daily. Not once a week on Sunday. Can I be honest? 
this is easy. Do you think it's hard for people to walk in the door in church on Sunday morning or Sunday night and act like everything's together and praise the Lord, Pastor Dave, glory to God. Great! You put your affair on pause for Sunday, but Monday you're living in sin. Great! You're not watching porn at church, but you are on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Great! You're not lying or thieving or being a raging alcoholic on Sunday morning or Sunday night. But you are the other six days of the week, right? And guess what? That's because you and I are sin-bound, sick, and broken unless you and I surrender daily. Not one-hit wonders. Like, we've got to surrender daily. Take up your cross daily. Die to self daily. Why? Because the sin monster's going to knock on your door. Hey, sin's fun. Right? You don't need to go to church. Hey, you already there on Sunday. You did your thing. It's Monday afternoon. Knock, 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 knock. No, then if you want to have this catalyst experience with God, then it's got to happen in you before it can ever happen through you. And guess how it happens? Daily. Like, this is why I hate the business of church. Like, I'm not moved by large rooms of people. I'm not, who cares? Because if your life sucks the other six days of the week and you did good for an hour at church, who cares? I don't, you shouldn't, and God don't. God goes, great. They went to church and heard it for an hour, but they still live like hell. Right? Like, and then we get into that habit, if I serve more, if I give more money, if I give more time, if I do more events, if I do more for others, then I will just somehow be a good guy who or gal who makes it in. That's not it, man. That's not grace. You know how we earn this? <laughs> Surrender. Do you want to get your life in the right position to have a catalytic awakening first in you and then God to awaken this thing inside you to be it? Can I tell you how that happens? Daily surrender. Surrender. Not a one-hit wonder. Stop playing magic one Jesus. It doesn't work. Daily surrender. Moment by moment. For the fit and flourish of the Holy Spirit in your life. You ever, have you ever seen somebody who's like in really good shape? Yeah? And you're like, man, they're in really good shape. I think of like Coach Sterling back there, right? right? Coach is like jacked. I got to get on that muscle machine over there, right? They're in good shape. You ever see somebody go, man, it's just like genetics. No, yeah, genetics and hard work. Like we're like, I want abs. Well, stop eating 20 donuts a day. You got to work for what you want. Not wish for it, pray for it. Daily surrender in order to be spiritually fit and flourish. If you ain't surrendering daily, don't be surprised when you're failing. That's all of us. Can I tell you something? Pastors don't get an exemption because they went to Bible college. No, you know what we get? A heavier judgment. A harder sentence. It says, be cautious, be careful. Those who call yourself preacher, teacher. You'll be judged more sternly. Great. So my life, when it sucks, I know that the judgment's going to be sucky. Number two, daily surrender. Number two, situational surrender. Lean not upon your own understanding. Number one, daily surrender for fit and flourish. To be catalytically moved in and through. Number two, situational surrender. Lean not upon your own understanding. Acknowledge God in all your ways and he will make your path straight. Lean not upon your own understanding, but acknowledge God. Lean on him. He'll make your path straight. Because it's real easy when everything's breezy in your life, right? When it's easy peasy, right? It's like, oh, life's so good. We're just kicking it with Jesus. And then a bomb goes off. And I believe it was Martin, Dr. Martin Luther King who says you can see the character of a man who they really are under duress and stress, not in good times. When the bomb blows up and all things go to hell in a handbasket in your life, which they have and which they will, that is when the real you shows up. And it's in those situations that you have to surrender to God. 
daily surrender, situation of surrendering, lean not upon your own understanding. Acknowledge him in all your ways. He, God, will make your path straight. When he does that, he can do a catalytic work in you, and then he can use that to do a catalytic, catalytic work through you. Ready? Number three, intentional refinement. Search the heart of God. You want to you really take it to the next level? You really, you really want the Lord to tap you on the forehead and say, okay, I dare you to intentionally ask for refinement. You get down on your face and you say, God, show me any wicked way within me. Show me any impure thought in me. God, show me anything that is separating me from the goodness of God. Oh, don't get it twisted. If you ask, he'll show you. And you better be ready to do work. And weed the garden of your life. Because when you really surrender to him daily and surrender situationally to him throughout the course of life. And then your intention is to say, God, search me, try me, examine my heart, reveal to me anything that shouldn't be there. He's a good, gracious God and he will reveal it to you. Why? So that he as a catalyst can work in you and then he as a catalyst can work through you. But when you ask that question, you got to be ready to deal with the trash that comes up. Oh, God, you're right. I really don't like that person. At all. Well, I want you to love that person. Ooh, hey now. Let me just tell you why that's not really going to happen right now, Lord. Okay. Well, then he'll just hit the pause button for you and go, okay. Whenever you're ready to participate in daily surrendering, situational surrendering, and asking the intentional refinement of your life. How many of you get before God and say, God, try me, show me, reveal to me what needs revealed and changed in my life? You do that? Man. You want to be a catalyst? You want this awakening? You want, you want to have a, 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 a catalytic moment with God? That he works in you first and then through you? Then you got to surrender daily. You have to surrender all your situations when they arise. That means the past, the present, and the ones that you don't even know are going to happen yet. And you got to get into the habit of intentional refinement. Test me, try me, God. Reveal to me, show me, put your finger on it, expose it. How do I deal with it? How do I address it? You do those three things, you will find yourself walking in a relationship with God and a faith that's alive and well. If you don't do those things, you'll find yourself going to church and wondering why life still sucks and things still don't make sense. And why you're kind of angry all the time and bitter all the time. You spend your life more frustrated than you do with favor. Right? Making declarations of faith. Does anybody want to have a catalyst engagement with God Almighty? Man, I know I do. I love this. A catalyst. Something that comes and brings change without being changed itself. You know what's really awesome? When you have a catalyst movement with Jesus, and then all of a sudden he uses your life to be catalytic, that means you take this person and this person, and the Holy Spirit uses you to bring change between those two people, those two things, those two environments. It doesn't impact or change your life, but God uses you right where you are to change the world one life at a time. Amen? Let me pray for you, church. God, we're grateful for your love and your mercy tonight. We thank you that you're a God who does this deep catalyst work in us and then does this deep catalyst work through us. God, thanks that we're just, we are literally, God, killing the business vibe of the church. We're not here to be religious. We're not here to do it, do Sunday good. God, we're here to stop sucking at life. God, we're all here, Lord, just saying we're sinners who are saved by grace. We're broken people who need to daily surrender, who God need to surrender situationally, who God needs intentional refinement, but we believe the word. And the word tells us, God, that you're going to do it in us through the promise of the Holy Spirit and then through us. There's a reason it's part B. Through us comes after in us. God, I pray that faith would come alive for people that their life would be lived and their faith would be so electric and on fire. It'd be free. A catalyst movement for freedom. We thank you, we do pray this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Church, this um, evening.
as we get ready for our tithes and our offerings. Uh, the financial team, they're super awesome. And the company, they just ask, fill these out. Um, this just does a good job of helping keep accountability. Even if you are a cash giver, and, and lots of people, if you look on the screen behind me, a lot of people give online, and that's just easier for them. That's cool. However, you are honoring God in your giving, continue to do that. Um, but they're going to ask if you fill these out. That just helps accountability for you and for us as a body, right? If you give online, there's just that accountability already built in. But uh, this evening as we give, keep this in mind. This ain't a business transaction between you and Dave Beaver or you and the house. This is a covenant biblical transaction between you and God. And as you give, we give in accordance with scripture. And we are better together in this missional community and living. This is how we do it, right? All of us together. So uh, I'm going to have the guys and gals come at this time. Let me pray for us. Father, thank you for uh, the tithes and the offerings. Biblically, God, we give in your name in accordance with your word. And I pray, God, you will multiply it. Lord, I am, uh, we are blown away by the generosity of God's people, by the favor that you have shown us in these early days. Lord, that we know that the house represents you. It's a simple house of prayer, of praise, and of salvation. It's a house of empowerment that these men and these women might scatter and live as catalysts. But you're going to do a deep work in them. That's what you're doing tonight. You're setting us up for work in us. But God, then you're going to do some work through us. And God, we thank you in advance. It's just through your story that you might be glorified in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. This morning, guys, or this evening here is um, we're going to do our tithes and offerings. I'll just point your, your direction. A couple of things. There's some great uh, groups that meet every other Thursday night. There's a new young adult uh, Bible study that meets every other Wednesday night. Uh, we'll get you more information about those. Because here's the deal. We don't want to just show up on Sunday and be good at doing church. If we ain't living this thing, then we're going to struggle to be everything we talk about, right? Lots of great mission opportunities where we are serving others coming up um, with the Driven Foundation, some others. Uh, just really cool opportunities to be the hands and feet of Jesus. My favorite thing as your pastor is not standing up preaching. My favorite thing is sitting down with your families one-on-one -on -one or five of five families and hanging out and knowing your stories. But then not only that, then hearing the, how God's using your life throughout the course of the week. I had a great conversation today with the Jennings of how God just put them in the right position at the right time and used their life in a radical way to be Jesus to a perfectly good stranger. Guys, that's what it means to be a missional community. We want to celebrate those stories on Sundays, and we want to celebrate those stories throughout the week. Amen? All right, church, I love you. Um, I cannot wait to see you guys next week as we will uh, continue week two with our Catalyst um, movement. Anybody who's willing to help out, uh, we run kids' teams, one team, once a month. And there's a few spots left on the back table, so uh, sign up and... Uh, We'll keep serving people together. We're in this together. Amen? All right. God bless you guys. We'll see you next week.